know, what I'll probably do is kind of go bring things over to you in an order that... Um, well, let me do... You want to know how all this started? Yes. How did all this, <laughs> how did this all start? Yes. I realized right now that at one point in my life, or for many years, I was Bill instead of Charles, because my father was Charles Henry Britton, and they wanted me to be a Charles, but they wanted some way to differentiate us, so I became Charles William. So for the first 15 or 20 years, a lot of people knew me as William. Of course, that meant Bill. And when I was even younger, Billy, which made me Billy Boy, which was like fascinating to rediscover. But for a long time, I didn't want to think of it that way. And I recently found uh, the, my copy of Alice in Wonderland that my sister Frances had given me when I was six years old, said to Billy Boy, to, or to Brother Billy Boy, or something like that. And so at some point, I became Charles, which sounds me a little more grown up. But I was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, about a 70,000 population town in the middle of cornfields. That's the, you know, corn is the Iowa symbol. And corn and packing plants uh, and a sort of view of the world when you're a young man in Iowa, your view of where you can go is Chicago because that's comprehensible. New York and San Francisco maybe exist. It's either go to Chicago or join the Navy. And I, my equivalent was not my choice. My mother, uh, after my father died, moved us, the two of us, to Los Angeles in 1944, right in the middle of the Second World War. She just decided to start a new life and left Iowa behind, left my stamp collection behind, the only thing I really have much grievance about. I didn't mind leaving the clarinet behind, but my stamp collection keeps coming to my mind. Um, I had a very good childhood. Uh, I had my, I was born late in my mother's life. I'm sure I wasn't anticipated, but because I had two older sisters, they were 17 and 18 years old when I was born, they felt no competition. They just loved having a baby brother boy to play with. And so I had my mother who was who was less stressed because she had her, her daughters. I got lo three loving women in my life, which, which predisposed me to enjoy the world. And for a long time, I thought women were just perfect. At a certain point, I found out that wasn't always true. But it gave me an attitude toward life, even though I felt abused being relatively poor, and I knew the social stratifications of our community uh, in terms of feeling valued and loved, I got a wonderful start. And that has stayed with me ever since. Why did your mother pick Los Angeles? She, and this is kind of hard to believe, both my parents were from farm families, and they were the educated members of their families, which meant they went to teacher training school, which is, I guess, the equivalent of college, not universities, and they became teachers. And she, before she got married, my mother, wanted a flame. So she and a friend from, they were, she was living in Illinois at the time, came to Los Angeles, came to California, like in 1904, I believe. Kind of hard to think of this as current history, but it was. Uh, and she, they, she spent like six months, she and her friend spent six months in California. She made friends at that time, in 1904, who still existed as friends in 1944. And so when she decided to change her life, to leave everything behind because with my father dead and her social status vanished, uh, here was a chance to start again and she had friends in, in Los Angeles who let us live in their garage. And you know, it was kind of an adventure, take a, tr a train during the middle of the war to a new city. Uh, I went to Fairfax High School in 11th grade, which was culture shock. So I that, wasn't, that I, was the first time when you came when you were in 11th grade, when you were in high school? Mm -hmm, yes, and I suddenly wasn't the smartest kid in the class anymore. That was unusual. I'd never seen a delicatessen. I guess I'd seen some black people around the train station. Cedar Rapids was on the main railroad line, so there were, you got to see 
porters on the train and you, if you hung out at night watching the trains come by. Uh, but I, I, I stayed with friends, my mother's friends, uh, and that was strange because they asked me, they didn't like it, they said, how do you like living in Kite Canyon? I didn't even know what they meant, I just knew it didn't sound right. I found out very fast, you know, uh, there are parts of the world that just were not agreeable. Right, and just to back up, is it, how did your father pass away? He had uh, he'd volunteered to teach uh, mathematics to Air Force pilots, and that took him to, to some big uh, training station in Nebraska where they were overworked and ill-housed and he got pneumonia, and he came home with a very badly damaged heart uh, and lasted about six or eight months before he just died of heart failure. Um, and when you left Iowa, did you have grandparents or aunts and uncles or extended family that you... My two sisters were in Iowa. They, they were, didn't come with you? No, they, they, were, were, they were grown and independent and had their own careers or marriages. But, and I did have grandparents and cousins who were all in the Midwest. So when, he came, when we came to Los Angeles, it was just the two of us. Uh, we were an independent family and had to basically start from scratch. And, and for some reason, I was able to do that. Uh, 11th grade at Fairfax High School, 12th grade in Pomona, then UCLA. So I was moving from one place to another, not making any new lasting relationships until I got to college when all of this started. And I can't even imagine what Los Angeles, you know, what kind of a transition that was like. What was it like for you coming to LA and being, you know, what types of things were you exposed to? <laughs> well, I'd, ne like I'd never gone to a movie in the afternoon and had someone come over, sit next to me, and put, put his hand on my knee. I mean, I know that must have been happening in Iowa. This, I didn't know anything about it. You know, it was a total, from being a Republican, because my parents had sort of an anti working class feeling because they had moved into the professional group class being teachers. Uh, I became a Marxist in six months at Fairfax High School. Uh, I made a few friends at, from, from Fairfax in 11th grade who I met later in, at UCLA, and they turned me around in terms of politics and culture. And when I, but I didn't get any cultural stimulation, basically, except from reading enormously, which I did from childhood, until I went to UCLA. And I suddenly, there were avant-garde film societies, there was art, and um, I was moving in that direction. And was your family involved with the arts at all when you were growing up? Like, was your mother, did she play? Oh yeah, she, she was a member of the Shakespeare Club. Okay, so very, that was the extent. Very, very cultured, a lot of, enormous amount of reading. And that's one of the things that, that started me in the right direction. I just read enormously, always. I started reading early and, I've never, and I haven't stopped. And what was your first experience with the arts when you were here, I mean, it sounds like in UCLA, you know, was it going to see films or did you go to museums? I didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't do anything until UCLA. And at that point, everything, there, there, there were the avant-garde film societies, there were museums, and immediately I met people. And I think probably because at that point I was politically radical, I was also looking for unconventional, anti-establishment, uh, basis to, to create my own identity, because I certainly was alienated. I was lonely, I didn't have a family, which was probably good because I didn't have to rebel against my family. Uh, my mother was just happy as long as I was happy, and she was not, she took me to church all the time. I went to Sunday school from the very beginning, but it was more a social, uh, appropriate thing to do, uh, and so I never was indoctrinated. I was just exposed to, every year, a different church. At one point we were high Episcopal, and I got to swing the censer and the incense. I liked that. That was fun. Ritualistic. Yes, mm -hmm. and, it was, and there was a sensual thing about all the garments and the robes and stuff. And when you enrolled at UCLA, what was your what was your major? I was going to be a, a journalist because it, 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 in twelfth grade I was editor of the school paper, and I won scholarships both at USC and at UCLA. Uh, and, uh, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just knew it was going to be challenging 
the rules, but I didn't really know what that meant exactly. And did you, were you involved, did you used to go to the Coronet Theater? And Coronet was like the, 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 it was like, that was an explosion of experience. I mean, things happened to me that I didn't understand emotionally. I understood how powerful art could be because all of a sudden I was crying or I was having exhilarating, exhilaration that I couldn't identify the source of. I mean, I figured it out, and there's something about art. If it could do it to me, I certainly wanted more of it. And then at a certain point I found that you could be, you could create art. Though I didn't think of it that, you know, it wasn't that impressive an idea that I, you could do something that meant something to people. What types of films did you see that? Everything, because the uh, coronet uh, had, was showing all the uh, avant-garde films from the Museum of Modern Art. And somewhere in my collection are the, pro are the coronet programs, which can document exactly what I saw, which is what everybody was seeing who was avant in the avant-garde. And uh, that was, and, you know, and a lot of European, uh, and the, the uh, Carl Dreyer's The uh, Passion of Joan of Arc was like one of those things that did it for me. And I never had had an experience like that. I mean, somebody explained to me later, you're just watching a woman in bondage. I don't really think that was the secret. No, but but that was probably part of that yeah. was probably part of it. And did you come into contact with Kenneth Anger and Curtis Harrington and the Whitney Brothers? And, uh, at UCLA, at UCLA I did. When, uh, yeah, both, when their films were just re first released, I was in the crowd of people who saw them. And that was like, that was one avenue to go. It was, you know, avant-garde and surreal. It was not political, but I, and, and I was primarily political uh, in terms of like trying, what I thought was important to do, but I knew what was personally important to me were these emotional self-examination, uh, exploring the unknown psychologically. That was what moved me deeply. What was important to me intellectually were the political struggles because there was the ban the bomb, bomb movement, and the, Cold, <clears throat> and the Cold War was starting. So there, there were plenty of things to be stimulated and challenged by. And what, did you, what were those political things that were happening, and how did you, get, how did you find yourself getting involved? Actually, I started um, when I was in 12th grade. Um, I wrote a letter to the Communist Party in Los Angeles because <laughs> that seemed to me like the logical place to get information that I wouldn't get anywhere else because they were, the, they were already the devils. <clears throat> and I said, you know, what's going on? Share with me. And, uh, and, I, and so I was living in Pomona then with my mother and my uh, older sister who'd come out to, and she was teaching uh, one of the high schools there, and two young people came to, came from Los Angeles to see me, a returning veteran and his wife, because there here was a potential recruit in Pomona High School, and they came and talked to me and explained the, the beginning of the Cold War, imperialism and everything. So right from the beginning I was listed as, as a communist sympathizer. If they were doing dossiers then, that's when mine started. And that carried over to UCLA, the Cold War, the, the divisions were already there. There was a struggle over racism. That was, you know, these things had been going on for generations, but they were, at each stage there was a certain point. There, there, were, there were all the black veterans coming back from the Second World War, which changed the tone of, of, of culture. And there were also the fact that veterans were coming back. They were still young, and they'd been in Europe, and they'd been in Asia, and they brought a level of sophistication and knowledge that you couldn't have got in, in, in normal college years. So there was the struggle, the ban the bomb movement was there, was big. The first beginning of, of the American racial struggle that, you know, that, that took until the 60s to really come to fruition was brewing at that point. And I was in, in on all of that stuff. But that, what that meant was just going to meetings, going to rallies, circulating petitions, passing out leaflets. But that was a lot. It was a lot to right. do. And, then, and also, growing up, 
I mean, discovering sex, discovering psychoanalysis, everyone had to be, everyone needed analysis. And we believed we could do self-analysis. For a period, a period of time, there was a, a couple of years of students who believed, and there, was a, there were a couple of psychoanalysts who were teaching, you can do a lot of self-analysis. So we did a lot of self-analysis. It's a perfect time when you're, you know, a young adult and you're coming into your own and trying to figure out your place in the world. These are, this is when you do all those things and you investigate different areas. And at that point, I was, I was open to anything I didn't know about. That if, 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 I, if I was ignorant of it, it, it was fascinating. I mean, I didn't get stuck in any of the uh, cults. There was a lot of uh, mysticism, uh, and that didn't stick. I went through it, but mainly I watched my friends become yogas and uh, do all sorts of strange things. But, and that there's a whole part of the beat culture, which I have many records of, of uh, Eastern religions were, being, were, were, were growing again. They, they had been very big in Southern California in the 20s and 30s. And this, this once after the war, that all revived. Uh, Gerald Hurd and Aldous Huxley, you know, they were all here. And they gave lectures that you had to, you went to casual meetings where there are people who became names, but at that point they were just interesting eccentrics. Uh, and you might become a follower. Did uh, you ever go to Manley P. Hall's um, Theosophical Research Center? I, I knew about, I knew about that, that, that group and that circle, but I didn't. So how did you find yourself being drawn? You know, I pulled out some of your early poems and collage materials, and we have a lot more collage material here. How did you find yourself being drawn to investigating the various arts, and how did it come to it, some of this work? When, when I, you just kind of explain what when I, when, I, when I look at the poetry, it's like a young man growing up, romantic, self-absorbed, <laughs> corny. I mean, I look at it, I like it a lot because it's, it's me. Uh, but I don't think I, I think that's probably what uh, just, I think, growing up, sort of open to wildness, let you do. But it wasn't original, there, there was nothing original. These are all, it's work, work of a certain period of a young man uh, growing up. So did you read poetry? Did you write, oh. a, keep a journal? Did you write a lot of poetry? Did your poetry ever get published? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, actually somewhere, somewhere in the collection here, there's a, there's a, a, a little mag, a, a, San Francisco little magazine called Contour, which published a, a story, a you know sort of avant-garde expressionist uh, little drama, uh, which is a little embarrassing. And I, I wrote letters to people I, like Kenneth Patchen and sent him examples of my work, and uh, got nice letters back, and things like that. Got quoted in Poetry magazine as an example of the corny. Uh, Totally predictable, expect, you know, indulgence of uh, youth, youth, uh, untrained, self, you know, self-indulgence. I treasure that. And I got quoted in, in the most negative, dismissive way. That felt good. I mean, you know, whatever you're doing, register. And if some establishment literary critic thought you were corny, all right. At least you had a reaction. Oh, I mean, rather probably. If you, if it had been some avant-garde critic who thought I was corny, but no, for some establishment magazine, to, that, 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 that they got it. I mean, obviously I was an enemy. Yes, yeah. right. And and the collage, the early collage work. How did you come to start doing that? Did you continue to do that? For I a probably while? didn't do that until five to ten years later, when I met some genuine artists. Though we didn't think of them as artists, when I met the Burmans and the people in the Burman circle, I, I don't think I did collages. I don't think I did any physical. I was more or oriented toward being a writer okay. and a poet, and then gradually that phased in photographic work. And then when I met the Burmans and met the that circle of, of artists and creative people, uh, the, the rest of them. Which, the techniques were, were available to me. So at, at one period, the, like you, you'll find, if you looked at the dates, if we could get the dates, 
they wouldn't they weren't all simultaneously they these these would cover a 10 or 15 year period right and we do have all the dates here we can look that up can you tell us which um the, can you tell us a little bit about the three photographs that are placed in front of you yes i can <laughs> the photograph the photograph of me with a magic kit probably was when i was 12 years old i'm just I'm throwing, throwing the numbers in. I'd been given a magic set, and I was at that point. I had a more affirmative, positive, outgoing personality that I that I could consider standing up in front of a group of people and performing magic tricks suggests a certain more poise. Let's see, it's not even it's not dated, but it had to be when I was still in Iowa. That would be probably in the uh, I may have been eight or ten years old. 10 or 12. Wow. That's the earliest picture of this group. And the, uh, the other two pictures are pictures of me at, when I was at UCLA. And well, probably dated by my mother, but this is like one of them, the one in color is in 1947. And I had written it and put it, I'd written on the back to Jean, one of my sisters, a Valentine signed Bill. So this is this is Bill. <laughs> I was still Bill. And on this one, Bill Britton. Somebody wrote William Britton, Fran's brother. My other sister. <coughs> but when I came to UCL, came to Los Angeles, I started the transition from being William Britton to becoming Charles. Because the teachers at Fairfax saw me saw as Charles William Britton. They didn't ask me. They called me Charles, because that's what it read, and I, and I wasn't in any position to say I could be old. I, I suddenly became Charles, but I didn't like it. So I said, I, I uh, acknowledged it for a period of some months. I, I signed myself, my name is S initials C. William Britton, which is sort of pretentious <laughs> and, and, and funny. And then I went through a period where I was Charles W. I was still keeping the bill. And I have some friends now from UCLA who were, who were in on that transition, one of whom called me Charlie Bill. So apparently it was a matter of a, you know, an identity crisis of some sort. Yeah. And then the, the, the Bill vanished. Except when I tell stories about my sisters teaching me jokes. They taught me a joke when I was a little boy. I had, I had very bright red hair most of my life very bright when I was maybe five or six years old. And they taught me a joke, which I participated in not knowing what at all what it was. Uh, they taught me to answer a, qu the, a question, which they generally had their boyfriends pose to me. Where did you get your red hair, Billy? And I would say, they taught me, from the Iceman. Now, it's, that reflects the days before people had refrigerators. You had chunks of ice delivered by the Iceman okay. uh, with his tongs and his 25 uh, pound blocks of ice. And they, everybody thought that was very uproarious. <laughs> and it was only much later in life that I realized what the joke was all about. Uh, right, yes, visiting that. your mom, the Iceman <laughs> and the milkman. And I realized my sisters were, were pretty racy. I didn't realize uh, you know, how fast the, that, that crowd was. That's what they, they had rumble seats in their roadsters then. And I got to ride in the rumble seat uh, when one of my sisters and their boyfriend were take, to take me out for a ride. But I was in the rumble seat and they were in the front seat. Cool. So how did you first come to um, photography? When were you, I mean, were there shows that you saw? Like, when did you start thinking? Was it part of it was know, probably when I, It was probably at UCLA when I realized I didn't have, and I watched people making experimental films. And I saw that they needed a little more financial resources and a better support group in order to put together making a, a personal experimental film. It just took more. Now, nowadays, with digital and the equipment available, I probably would have said I could probably do it too. But I felt not that confident. But I knew I could take still photographs. It didn't require get, getting a crew together. It didn't require doing anything. You could do it in a solitary nature. And that was at UCLA. 
And so that was less out of the journalistic studies, but more out of the artistic, experimental, avant-garde film experience. Yes, and, and it was being around, I, went, I did a, took a number of film courses, which I felt very good about, but I just knew when I saw the people who were able to make experimental film that I just didn't have that confidence. Uh, but I could, but I did feel good about taking still photographs. And so, do you remember when you got your first camera and the things that you started to photograph? It, it was in, in, in UCLA, at UCLA, well, probably 1947 or 48. Uh, totally inadequate, but uh, at that point I was still see, seeing myself as a writer. And so gradually, it took a four or five year period to realize I needed good equipment in order to get the results because I was comparing my work with Edward Weston and Paul Strand and people like that. And it wasn't that wasn't very encouraging. So what were your first subjects and did you develop your own music? Mm -hmm. I photographed, uh, well, like uh, uh, dead birds on the beach. I did a lot, a lot of very solitary things because I, I was isolated and I didn't have much confidence. And then I started photographing my friends. And gradually, as my skills uh, improved, and my awareness of, by the response of people that did have judgment and taste and more experience, I probably was guided into doing a certain type of documentary, real, realistic work. And then when I started being around a lot of people who were using a lot of drugs, I started seeing surrealist images that were accessible to me. So never when I was, I never could do anything high. That is completely the idea that drugs increase a photographer's skill. I don't think is true. It's well, someone asked me how you think it does, and then the next day you look and it's I think musicians. I think story. musicians and some artists. I think it definitely can enhance and take you places. But for me, uh, no, I had to be. I had to be straight and cool. So maybe we can look at some. It sounds like some of your first photographs were of your friends and of the scene and Wally Berman and folks along those lines. Would that, would that be a fair statement? Sure. Like, the, also, for, for, like the, the poetry that's here in front of me was written while I was at UCLA. That was? Mm -hmm, yes. I can, so I can tell by the paper. Okay. All right, good. And these were later on. I'm just going to move this. I guess one of my first questions, I'm not actually going to sit over here with you for a little bit, sure. uh, but you could, if you could still kind of look towards the camera, if that's, if that's feasible. Mm -hmm. um, is that okay, John? Mm -hmm. So I guess my first question is, how did you um, come into contact with Wally Berman? How did you meet these guys? Was it just at like openings? and How did you meet Wallace Berman? I met him through a friend. And my friend probably knew him because of a drug connection. And I knew my friend just from being in college with him and finding him congenial, one of my, men, one of my few men friends. And all it took is one, one link. And at that point, my first marriage, I think, was ending. And I was very alone. Again, I mean, I had a lot of friends, but I was alone emotionally. And Wally and Shirley, became sort of my, my, my family. And they were very permissive. We immediately found that we enjoyed being together. We did things that were compatible and agreeable. I brought things to Wally, and Wally brought things to me, and Wally and Shirley uh, 
as a couple, uh, I became a member of their family. We just spent a lot of time together. And it was just a, co a combination of one person meeting another person. It wasn't, I didn't, I didn't initially know them as part of a movement. They weren't part of a movement then. At that point, they just knew a variety of people, but the, the, the groups hadn't formed yet. People were circulating very freely, and some people would come in and out of our lives and never be seen again. And then sometimes you'd see somebody a year or two later, and then you, you, you would link up. Uh, it was all in a very, form, it was a very formative period. When you look back at everybody's life history, uh, the late, the late, the, the 1950s, uh, the move that you could see the, the basis of the movements that became solidified and clearly identifiable in the 10, 15, 20 years later, but they weren't, they hadn't shaped up yet. And what, what type of person was he? What was it? A, a cool, laid back person who just was agreeable to be with, a personality that was it was agreeable, like you, there, were, you, there were sweet emotions that you felt. Uh, he wasn't a guru, he didn't uh, present himself as being wise, he was a person that you, you were comfortable with and you could do easy, nice things together. And then, you, and then I think we all shaped each other. At some point I had the idea, it was like we were all grooming each other, the way animals groom each other. Uh, it feels good. And it was very, and none of us were self-important, and none of us thought about being artists. We were just doing avant-garde things, but in such a small circle, we didn't see ourselves as part of movements. We just like a small group of friends, uh, sort of so, taking care of each other. Well, and you get that sense when you look through some of these photos that they were kind of a really, it just, they had a family unit that looked very calm and relaxed and welcoming. Do you think, can you can you just look through some of these um, photos and if there's things that you want to tell us? That's very like funny. That's a really right. intimate moment for me. Uh, uh, we were doing things like an extended family. Uh, here's uh, Shirley cutting Wally's hair. Shirley's brother Donald was going to beautician school and he was practicing on all of us. Uh, we were on the fringe of people who were sort of in cultural movements, but we weren't uh, important enough or substantial enough to be anything but sort of watching and hanging and hanging on, hanging around. There's just too much. Right, so I, what I thought was maybe I could pick out a couple of things. And they were pretty, they were very open to letting you photograph. Oh, there was no, there was no self-consciousness. We can sort of see, these are like family pictures, like nothing posed, the kids are there, no one's dressed up, people are sitting on the floor. Uh, Just hanging out. Yes. Mm -hmm. And did they live in Venice? Because this no, looks like this. In, was... They lived in Beverly Glen. Okay. They had a house on the hillside of Beverly Glen. But this, is, these, these streets in Venice are views outside. I lived on Speedway in Venice uh, before the marina existed, and that was sort of the end, end of the world, the end of Los Angeles. It, it was empty. Venice seemed in those photographs. Venice seemed so remote. Well, it was. It was very. It was, and, and uh, there were very few people living there. I felt it was very, very quiet the first year. Later, after the Beatnik movement was identified, it became, you know, sort of over, over publicized. But at this point, it really was the end of the world. It felt quiet and it felt safe. What did you guys, when, when, when uh, Larry Lipton wrote his book, I mean, was there kind of a movement against <laughs> that, well, we, thinking like this is kind of silly or that we're not part of this? Or well, we knew we weren't part of it because it, that was very self-promotional. Promotion, it was like trying to make, trying to make a movement. And uh, we, just, we simply weren't part of it. We just knew it was going on. And, and Wally specifically, as he became a little bit more identified, was very resistant to the commercial exploitation of something you know, that had just been, you see, just people hanging, hanging, around, hanging, hanging around with each other. 
And I always liked some of, uh, some of these photos. You, what was from from when Arson Wells made his, made the film Touch of Evil? Yes, and he came to Ven he came to Venice, and any, anytime you want to see what Venice looked like then, it's available in that movie. So what did you when you are we in the shot now? That's better. Okay. Um, when you, how did you even know that they were shooting? Did you like look out your window where there like huge lights and things? Yes. <laughs> and in fact, Wally and I would be working in the dark room, my dark room, and we we watch the uh, the lights when they were shooting on the, in the canals with the oil wells. Well, of course, it wasn't that crowded. I mean, you 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 just knew if a film was being shot anywhere within half a within five miles, you 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 would spot it and you would. Pay attention. At that point, it shows exactly how unexploitive we were because we didn't hang around shooting pictures of the film being made because that wasn't you know that was we weren't into like looking for celebrities even though now we realize what an opportunity <laughs> it would have been. But there were the, there were the remnants of the film like the set that was just put on on oceanfront walk in Venice. That's the opening shot, a very famous shot in in, the, in filmmaking. Uh, and that's Wally and Shirley walking through what was passing as a border. Uh, right, that's from the part of the opening, the yeah. part of the film. And I'm just going to, it's okay if I'm looking through some things and we can't see them, it's not the end of the world. So this is still when they were up in Beverly Glen. Mm -hmm. And how did you like? Did you would you like go up there and hang around and stay overnight? Like how how accessible were people? Or did at, they at, kind of at everybody's house, you would go and visit. Sometimes just hang around all day because most of us did not have steady jobs, or if we were going to school, and uh, and everyone was free to stay. At the end of the evening, if you were too tired or incompetent, uh, you it's all right for you to. They give you a pillow and you sleep on the Just floor. Just crash there, yes, right? Uh, and who is this? Oh, she was a very well. She wasn't famous then, but she was a very successful uh, high-class call girl, who was one of uh, Joan Whitney is her name. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes, she traveled with, with an acrobat uh, all over the world, Monte Carlo. She was one of King Farouk's girlfriends for a little while. And I only knew, found this out much later. Huh. I have a lot of photographs of her. I had no idea She's exactly. Stunning. In fact, she was a. She came along when I was married to my second wife in San, San Francisco. Uh, she was one of the witnesses. She had Wally and Shirley, and Patricia and I, uh, and Joan went to the uh, county, the city clerk in San Francisco, and huh. uh, yeah. She was a witness. Mm -hmm. And who's this? That's, his name is Bob Jones. He was one of the local artists and a very close friend of ours. Okay. Surely so photogenic. And do you feel like when you're looking through these, like, do you feel like that you went through that? That you thoroughly like went through your work and printed most of the good stuff that's there, or do you? Oh no, I think there's a great deal that never got printed. So you would go back just on a. I would just generally do at the time. I would make prints to share with people. I mean, no one was exhibiting, no one was playing with. But we, it says we exhibited by giving our work to each other, and then it would be on each other's walls. And occasionally, later in later years, I went back. And made prints when people begin to be began to be into it, but at the time uh, there was always something new, and so you, and I and we were no one was, we were not thinking of creating works of art. We were, right, you were document. You we were creating little treasures, pleasures to share with each other, and people would bring little sculptures or big sculptures. So did you feel like you were documenting the scene at all, or was it? No, no, we were just thinking pictures of our lives on sort of a day by, like that's what we did for fun. And part of the fun was being able to share it. And we didn't go back and look, look for treasures. I mean, people subsequently have, and because people wanted it, while I was printing my work, I did print a lot of things. 
because people were saying, oh, this is, has become important, interesting work. But that was always somebody else's imperative, not my own. Because I was always doing new things. And, pro and by that time, uh, I was doing a lot of political work. And that had its own imperative. You know, there trials to document and demonstrations that had to be covered. And once something was passed, you didn't go back until somebody else told you it was important because you were doing something new. Right. Did you guys want to change, do it close to changing the tape? Where was this one from? That was the Sindel Gallery, Walter Hopp's first uh, exhibition space in Brentwood. And that was probably a Hardy Richards exhibition. And at that point, that was the beginning of people start, started thinking of themselves as being in the art world. Um, and I, I can't actually give a time frame for that happening, but that probably was, was the significance of, of Walter and Ed Keenholz on the, on the art scene and the way it affected the circle of friends that I had. <clears throat> Some stayed isolated, we went to openings, but we didn't see ourselves as artists and other people definitely saw themselves as possibly having art careers. Some resisted for a while and then broke down. And this is, it's kind of a value judgment there because once you start seeing yourself as an artist, you have this com competitive thing about being successful, being an important, doing something good. As long as we were just depending on sharing with each other, we all felt we were good. And then all of a sudden we were exposed to the, mar the marketplace. And that created a lot of difficulty for people. Because not many people, not everybody succeeds. And the moment you start seeing yourself ranked, uh, a different psychology comes about. Right, well, the competition just changes the entire and, environment. And, and people stop being friends. They, they start becoming competitors. Can we take Yes, you guys are going to change the tape. <clears throat>